the industry will be less transactional and more relationship, in my opinion, in the long run. I think it's it's definitely going to grow that way, and people are going to find out they want to do more things with fewer people, and they're going to want to do, do those things with people they trust and have it be less about transactions and more about a long-term partnership. And I, I see that as a major shift. That was Mike Frino, chairman and CEO of Bearings. And this is Streaming Income, a podcast from Bearings. I'm your host, Greg Campion, and today we are diving into the trends that are currently shaping the asset management industry and how those may change in the years ahead. My guest today is Mike Frino. Mike is the chairman and CEO of Bearings. He has served in that role since November of 2020. And prior to that role, Mike held a variety of roles at the firm over the last 16 plus years, including portfolio manager and head of global high yield, head of global markets, as well as president of the firm. We cover a good bit of ground in a relatively short amount of time in this conversation, including Mike's biggest surprise thus far in his role as CEO, the massive importance of getting talent and culture right, and how important initiatives on the DEI front really play a role in that. We talk about what might be next for the industry on the ESG front, and we also discuss how and why technology will be critical in the years to come, both in terms of decision making and client service. Finally, we get Mike's prediction for what might change in the industry over the next five years. So with that, please enjoy this conversation with Mike Frino. All right, Mike Frino, welcome back to the Streaming Income Podcast. Thanks, Greg. Great to be here. I guess you've run out of qualified guests, so you've had to bring me back. But I'm <laughs> delighted to be here. Look forward to a conversation. Yeah, likewise, likewise. I don't know if you remember uh, the last time you were on the show, but I, I will remind you. Of course you. I remember. Absolutely. <laughs> it, was, uh, it was July of 2019, actually, and we were sitting here in this very room. Um, and I think back then, uh, your title was different than it is today. So you were ahead of uh, global markets. Uh, and we were talking about uh, some of the merits of non-traditional fixed income strategies. Fast forward to today, a lot, is, a lot has changed since then, including your title. So you took over as chairman and CEO um, of the firm back in November of 2020. So you're about 15 months uh, into the job now. Uh, obviously, a lot's gone on, the pandemic and, and many, many other things. Um, curious, you know, in that first 15 months, let's maybe let's start there. What, what's been the kind of biggest surprise for you um, in the role of chairman and CEO? Yes, I don't know if the listeners are interested in this, but for me personally, the biggest surprise has just been time management. There's a lot of things that that go into the role I didn't have to do when I was running predominantly the investment side of mm-hmm, things. And mm-hmm. so there's there's really my job as a time management to to make sure I'm focused on where I can add the, the best impact and the most impact to the firm. And that means letting other people do a lot of other things. And so um, when we go through volatile times in the markets, that means I need to just stay away and, and provide support rather than be in the weeds and, and getting in the way of things. So I think from that perspective, for me personally, that's been the biggest challenge is of finding out where I can be best utilized and where I can I can stay away and let others. Um, from a, overall, I'd say the, the it's been an incredibly pleasant surprise is how well the firm has adapted to some of the changes. I mean, we were we were very much a collaborative organization before, but I think we were very much collaborative in terms of in team based in a in a vertical sense as mm-hmm. opposed to a horizontal sense. And we've really emphasized that and it goes back to the culture aspect. We've been intentional about talking about it. And I could not have been more prouder of how over the last year and a half people have rallied together to work really reaching across parts of the organization to make us to make us better. Yeah, and yeah. that's that's just been a, a great surprise. Through a pandemic, even harder to communicate. You don't have the informal communications of walking around the hall and seeing someone. Um, it's been it's been incredibly positive to see and I'm I'm really grateful for it. Yeah, that's fantastic. I, I agree. I think it's been inspiring to see how the firm has has really come together. But I I, I think your point around time management is an interesting one and so important. And I think that the idea of kind of delegating responsibility and empowering your people. I think that's something that's come through uh, really from you throughout the the whole organization. Well, it's good. I think it was, and we've certainly recognized through the, the pandemic of how important 
I will say that the broader mental health is and that if we're all trying to do everything, we never get a chance to step away. Mm -hmm. And none of us can shoulder all the, the burden of things that need to get done. And so I think for, for my longevity and for everyone else's, let's focus on where the areas where we can add the most impact. Let's let others do their jobs and where they can add the most impact. And, and again, let people make decisions and empower people to make the decisions overwhelming majority of those decisions will be good. Even if they weren't decisions that I would make, I tell the folks who, who do report to me to say, look, you'll make 10 decisions a, a year that'll be big. Eight, I'll probably agree with 100%. Two, I may have done differently, but it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. they're, still, mm -hmm. they're still the right decisions. And so if we can have that throughout and then really start to simplify our business a little bit so people have time to, to add the value you know, our, our individuals are talented because of their ability to think, their ability to innovate, their ability to create. And if we have them tasked with doing things that aren't adding value, mm -hmm. whether it's over scheduling meetings, et cetera, that's, we're not getting the most out of our, our people and it's not what they want to give us. Yep. Yep. That makes a lot of sense. Um, okay. Well, turning to our clients. So, you know, Bearings obviously is a extremely client focused organization. Everything we do every day is focused on, you know, trying to come to the best outcome for our clients. I'm curious, you know, over the past, let's say, year or two, what's changed in terms of what our clients are asking for from us and maybe their other managers too? Yeah, it's so the, there's the, the the things that you tangibly touch. I mean, certainly data, transparency, right? Mm -hmm. Everyone wants mm -hmm. to see more um, of that, and they're, they're asking from that perspective, from a reporting standpoint. Um, in addition, I think we can you know, maybe expand upon this later in a discussion because I think it's worth worth revisiting. Is just they want more from fewer people, and so the idea of being able to provide more capabilities to larger clients. And as, as folks know, our partnership base and our client base is largely institutional, so they all are looking to expand what they do with their managers and not more managers. Um, but I think the one interesting thing I've seen evolved is there's so many questions out there of. Of all the topics that are very important, DEI, ESG, sustainability, they're asking the same questions that we're asking ourselves. What's the best way to have an impact? Mm. Right? We can sign on to a lot of things, but what we all want to come for this, and everything, everyone is very well intentioned, is what is the way we can make an impact for the long term? And if we use the phrase sustainability, what is something that's going to be sustainable for the long term? Not just something that we get a quick gratification because we look good from a statistic standpoint, but how are we building our, our company? How are we building our industry and working with our other partners in this to make sure that these are sustainable fixes that have the long term impact, not just an immediate impact? And I think they're asking those same questions. You know, they're, they're certainly coming in and asking, what's the best way to, to do this? Because they don't have the answer. So it's, it's encouraging um, that, that folks are acknowledging that this, this is going to take a lot of thought to work together to mm -hmm. get to an ultimate outcome because these are relatively large problems. Mm. Um, they're not unsolvable. Um, but they will be unsolvable if every institution, whether it be manager, whether it be asset owner, goes their own direction. We'll never get anywhere. Yeah, but, yeah. The, but the collaboration side of things, um, it will get us the results we want. And it's encouraging to see that they're asking the questions and it's more of a dialogue. Yeah, I think that's a that's an interesting way to put it in terms of, you know, nobody has this really figured out yet, but it's, it is more of a collaborative kind of effort. Um, I'm curious, just, you know, obviously we've seen uh, you know, ESG continue to be a bigger and bigger and bigger part of the conversation, it seems, every year. Uh, curious in terms of the conversations that you're having with our clients, uh, other industry leaders, uh, where do you think we go next? What do you think is kind of some of the next big developments there the next couple of years? Yeah, look, ESG is a, is a pretty broad area, right? Sure. With, with the E, the S, and the G, it mm -hmm. covers a lot of, of areas and pretty much covers just about everything that you do. And so if you, you think about where different parts of the world and each individual, frankly, we all have certain bias towards things that, that we prioritize. It doesn't, doesn't mean that they're all not very, very important, but everyone has certain passions that they feel more, more strongly about. And, and I think the way we want to go about it is explaining a philosophy to people. This is how we view things. This mm. is how we view the process through this. This is how we are going to attack it because these are the values that we have as a corporation. Um, and it, and it's, it's landed well on people. You, you mentioned earlier that people you know, aren't saying they've got it all figured out. Some people were. Years mm. ago, it was when it first started, it was the, the hot idea was we're just going to exclude A, B, and C from our uh, portfolios. Yeah. That, that will solve the world's problems. It won't, and it didn't. And I think a lot of those institutions that did that have now backtracked a little bit and said, that's probably not it. We've got to think about how do we do this. But if, if people come through with the philosophy, this is how we think about this. This is where our values are. Some folks will, will mesh up very, very well with some, some clients. Others, we, we may not. 
Mm -hmm. It's the authenticity of what's important to you. Why are you doing this? Mm. Why do you care about this? Is really what needs to start shining through and, and not just a glossy brochure of things that say, we do this, this, and this. But but the why is as important yeah. as the, yeah. the what. Yeah, it needs to be authentic. Mm -hmm. I've heard you say the the word impact a few times now. Um, so clearly that's a, that's a big theme. Um, along those lines, uh, you know, another area that's really a massive focus for bearings in the industry at large is uh, diversity, equity, mm -hmm. and inclusion, DE&I. Yep. Um, so talk to me about what you're seeing there from a bearings perspective, but also you know, very much interested in your view as an industry leader in the asset management industry, where you think that goes next. So there is no question that in our in our industry there is a lack of diversity, right? Mm -hmm. And it's gonna take a while to to fix that. And if there's if if we just between firms swap talent back and forth, that does that may mean bearings looks great from a diversity standpoint this year, but our competitor looks great next year because they've had we're not increasing the overall population. Yeah. So what are we really doing to be thoughtful to say we have to bring talented people into the industry mm -hmm. and, and educate them on what the industry means, what the opportunities are, and then probably equally important is keeping them in the industry. Because once you get up to a senior level, there's very few roles where you can pull people from different industries. It's really difficult to do. And mm -hmm. so if we haven't built that pipeline up over time, going out and bringing someone in at an MD level, it's hard to yep. do. Yep. And so I've really been focused on the efforts have got to be first retaining the talent that we have, mm -hmm. diverse and non-diverse. So sure. That's got to yep. be the primary thing. And then <clears throat> making sure we are taking steps from a cultural standpoint, and then from an, a, a recruiting standpoint to make sure that we are building that pipeline up. Right. But if we're creative, if we're smart, if we're innovative, we can actually impact our business and the community around us in a much more efficient way. I like that, um, the approach of trying to be innovative and also starting early, right? Um, and really impacting kids in, in university or even, even younger, um, starting to just help with that education in terms of what is this industry where where could you fit into this industry? How could you, could could you make an impact long term in this industry? Yeah, it's a. I mean, when when people talk financial services, certainly our niche within financial services is relatively small, right? I mean, the the, the banks are much larger, insurance companies are much larger, asset management is a relatively small um, part of the industry, and probably one that's not really well understood. Mm. I mean, many people going through school or, or come out and say, "I'm going to be a business major, an accounting major, a finance major." Very few say. We go into asset management, mm. and I think it's 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 an, a lack of awareness of what it is and what do we do. And, and if you you probably polled a lot of people who are even saying I'm going to go into asset management, they say I'm either private equity or hedge funds or equities. Mm -hmm. You mm -hmm. say, well, what about mortgages? Yeah, I think there is a, a lot of just informing people of yeah. what the benefits are in the industry and increasing that that um, group of people who want to come into our industry will help long term, and that's the sustainable model. Let me take a turn here and, and talk a little bit more specifically about markets. Um, don't worry, I'm not going to ask you to make an inflation yeah, uh, prediction here. Uh, but uh, yeah, that would, that would be the, the 2019 <laughs> mic I might ask that question to. But, uh, you would have got it wrong. Too, okay. <laughs> uh, let me ask you just about, uh, about private assets in general. So you know, um, over the last decade or so, we've seen just a massive increase in Allocations to private markets, whether you're talking about private equity, private credit, so many different um, asset classes there these days. Uh, curious for your prediction, I guess, in terms of where we go next on that. Is that a trend that continues? And if so, why? Yes, yeah, so I think I think the broader trend and the overall trend long term has been investors are looking for alpha generation. I start with that at the high level and say it's alpha generation. Mm -hmm. What we've seen is through the more liquid asset classes, specifically we'll just say domestic equities, the ability to provide alpha over an index or an ETF, it's really, really hard to do, especially if you're looking at large cap value. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that market's largely gone the way of, of, of passives because they say, I can't get the alpha, I can't get the excess returns that I need, so I'm just gonna, gonna get a beta product. As you move away from that, still, I think people are looking at providing alpha and fixed income and high yield and leveraged loans and mm -hmm. structured credit mm -hmm. and all those things. But the real area where you can add excess value is in, is in privates. Mm -hmm. And that's, I think, where the real approach has started to be is the ability to add 
incremental value through unique origination is where it's at now. I don't think people mm-hmm. are buying private assets just because they're private assets. They're buying them because it's a unique way to add incremental value at comparable risk to what I can get somewhere else. Right. And I think that's the key. I don't see that subsiding for a while, mm-hmm. but I always, when I talk to all investors and I, I talk to the teams, like our job is to provide excess returns. We can do it through picking better securities in the public market. We can do it through unique and valued added origination in the private markets. We're going to do both. Mm-hmm. Um, but there is no question that more of that opportunity is available in the private assets because you are generally originating unique things that that people can't get elsewhere. So we are going to continue to invest in that area. Uh, It's a business model that has less operating leverage just because the sourcing of it is is much different. Whereas in the public markets, you're either sourcing from an exchange or you're sourcing from a bank. Um, This is sourcing from individual borrowers. So the business model is is different, Uh, but we are clearly well positioned to continue to ride the, the trends that are moving there. But it's still, to me, the emphasis is, am I adding excess return against what someone else can get somewhere, somewhere yeah, else? Yeah. And if that changes, I don't think people will be that interested in private markets. If, if a private placement investment returns less than a public corporate bond for a long period of time, people are going to say, well, that's not it. Yeah. So I, I view it through the long-term lenses. We should always view ourselves as alpha providers. And mm-hmm. if we can do it through security selection or we can do it through origination, we'll do, we'll do whichever one's there. Okay, so you, so you mentioned origination and sourcing. Um, tell me a little bit more about that. Do you think that that's a big differentiator for bearings? And do you think that you know, as you have those conversations with clients, is that a very high priority in terms of what they're looking for from managers in this space? Hundred percent. That 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 is the differentiation between between managers is is the ability. I mean, again, it's table stakes. You have to be able to underwrite risk and price risk. Mm-hmm. They're expecting mm-hmm. us to be able to do that. But then your ability to actually go out and source the credible deals is one that that is is paramount to being successful in that. Uh, I think as you look at our our private credit business, we call it the middle market lending business. Mm-hmm. Um, the size and scale we have, the flexibility of our ability to go global has made us a complete differentiator in the bulk of the market. Not to say there aren't other good managers. We know that. And every industry we're in or channel we're in has good managers. Um, in private credit, we're definitely a top five. Mm-hmm. There's, there's very little argument about that. And so our ability to be thoughtful, creative, again, I'll, I'll highlight this group again as it relates to ESG. Both in the U.S. and in Europe, we were the first. Well, Europe first, U.S. second. We're the first to put private credit agreements that included ESG milestones that rewarded a, a company by reducing their interest rate. That's innovation. Yep. That's awesome. Right. I love it. I couldn't be more prouder of the teams that do that. So that just shows our uniqueness and how we approach things. Um, but up and down across all the risk spectrums in the private assets is the origination. On the more, what we'll say, private investment grade side of things, We've been doing it for such a long time mm. because our parent company has been a buyer of, of these types of products since they've been in existence. So we have the connections, we have the knowledge, we have the infrastructure, we have the ease of use to partner, which I think makes us valuable to counterparties. Um, and that's, that's important to, to investors. Yeah. You've mentioned uh, innovation um, a few times, and I want to just ask you specifically about technology. Mm -hmm. I know that you uh, and the senior leadership team have really emphasized investing in technology. Um, So I guess my question for you is, where do you see that kind of ultimately going? Uh, I'm curious how it benefits, you know, Bearings clients ultimately. And I'm curious just more generally, uh, you know, about your thoughts in technology in this industry, you know, in the, in the years ahead. Yeah. So for, from a, quickly from a client perspective, it, it should provide them more timely and better access to information. Mm-hmm. We should be able to give it to them much quicker if we've got the data in the right spot and we can, we can process it and, um, and, and analyze it much quicker in return. So from their perspective, it gives them a much better picture of what we're doing on a mm-hmm. more more timely basis. If you think about where we have exposure throughout the globe and throughout the asset classes, we touch an immense amount of data points, mm. whether it be tenants in our building, whether it be smaller companies that we lend to, whether it be bigger companies that we lend to. The, the public data is a little bit easier. Mm-hmm. Um, it's a little more structured, whereas the the private data is a little bit more unstructured. But the value in that and the insight in that is incredible. Yeah. If you can harness it in an efficient way, but if you give it to people in different forms, and one looks like an orange, one looks like an apple, one looks like a grape, I can't, mm. I can't do anything with this. And so that's it's a huge advantage to all the managers who tend to be in the private markets, of which we're one. 
but we're all challenging on a way to optimize that. You mentioned uh, up front in this conversation that transparency is something that our clients are looking mm-hmm. for, and I appreciate your transparency in this conversation and, and giving kind of a candid look into some of the things that Bearings is working on, struggling with, um, hopefully advancing on. Um, last question for you, as you look forward, I'm going to ask you to make a prediction again. Don't worry, it's not investment related. <laughs> but as you look forward, let's say for the next five years or so, um, and, and given you know the seat that you've been in now for 15 months and all that you've learned and all the information that you have access to, given that very informed opinion, I'm curious, what do you see that might change in this industry over the next five years that maybe others might not totally see coming yet? Yeah, you know, I, I really my crystal ball is not great when it comes to what you know, what's the next thing that changes the world, like an ETF or, or something like that. My, mine's probably a viewpoint of how we conduct business and how we 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 partner. I think transparency is going to be it's going to be critical, right? Mm-hmm. Clients are going to want to 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 see more, to know more, to hear more from you in, a, in an authentic way. I think. The trend towards this as having some humility that we don't have all the answers, mm. I think, is going to drive partnerships to be much, much stronger than they have in the past. And that's mm. partners in, from a client standpoint. That's partners from where we're originating from. I'll say this. The industry will be less transactional and more relationship, in my opinion, mm-hmm. in the long run. I think it's, it's definitely going to grow that way, and people are going to find out they want to do, I said this earlier, more things with fewer people, mm-hmm. and they're going to want to do, do those things with people they trust and have it be less about transactions and more about a long-term partnership. And I, I'd see that as a major shift, and I don't think people fully appreciate the conversations I've had with our clients recently, and you know, I'm pretty transparent and pretty open about what we do well and what we don't do well. I get a sense of appreciation that they have as saying, we know you don't have it all figured yeah, out. We know nobody yeah, does. Yeah. And the, the willingness to say, we need to work with you, we need to work with like-minded people like mm-hmm, you, mm-hmm. I think is going to really pay dividends for us as a business and also ultimately pay dividends on the areas that we want to improve our, our own company. But again, I said the emphasis is in our, our spheres of influence, whether that be the community and our, and our families and, and elsewhere. So not very profound in terms of you know the next, the next product that's going to change the world, but I think that's the way we do business will change. It will accelerate over the next Five years. Yeah, I think that's a really important idea, and um, that resonates with me. This idea of kind of humility, uh, ultimately leading to uh, stronger partnerships. I think that makes sense, and I think uh, I think you are uh, an example of that in terms of the way that you've you've led this firm since you've you've taken over fifteen months ago. So, thank you for that. I think uh, you know we talk about humility and transparency. I don't know along the transparency line that might mean you might need to be a more frequent guest on Streaming Income, uh, but we'll see. I, apparently, I wasn't asked in the last two years. So, oh, okay. So, okay. so yes, I would. Love to. I'll I've, take that scheduling snafu. I, I, that's got to be my. Uh, I certainly appreciate the, the opportunity to chat with you and and, and enjoy doing this. So when, whenever I'm invited, yeah. again, like I said before, I know what I'll, I'll do things where I can add value. And if I just get in the way, I'll get out of the way. Awesome. Thank you, Mike. Appreciate your time. Thanks, Greg. Appreciate it. Thanks for listening to episode number four of season six of Streaming Income. If you'd like to stay up to date on our latest thoughts on asset classes ranging from high yield and private credit to real estate and emerging markets, please make sure to follow us and leave a review on your favorite podcast platform. We're on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, and more. We publish a new episode every other week. And if you have specific feedback, you can email us at podcast at bearings.com. That's podcast at B-A-R-I-N-G-S.com. Thanks again for listening and see you next time.